Hi everyone. So I know that uh, some of you were asking for a video tutorial uh, for Lab 2 Home because uh, we're having some difficulties, particularly with the early part. So I figured we could go through the tutorial part and the setup of the exercises. Obviously not the exercises themselves, but we can go through the setup. Um, so the goal of Lab 2, um, our second home lab, is uh, to be looking at correlation. So what we had learned in the, the last unit uh, and seeing how we can uh, find correlation and plot correlation uh, in R. And this is a, a good building point from where we left off of the last lab. The last lab, one of the final things we did was looking at descriptive statistics um, for single variables. And when we're dealing with correlation, we're looking at how two variables are related together. So we've moved on from one variable to two uh, variables. Um, all right, so we'll go through kind of step by step and spend a little bit of extra time at the places where I think some of you may be running into uh, problems. So the first thing to do, um, even though we're only going to need the setup stuff um, for the most part later, um, I always put my setup at the, at the start. Um, so uh, I, we can talk about this now. You're only going to need this data here um, later, uh, but I still can do, we can still talk about it now. So the first thing is sending your working directory. Um, and this is something that uh, is definitely causing some people a little bit of trouble. So um, I can't tell you exactly what it's going to be on your computer because it's based on the file path of your own. Um, so I can help you out a little bit with PC. Um, those of you on a PC, those of you on a Mac, um, this would be easy with Google. Um, also, the, the logic is the same. So uh, I just can't tell you exactly how uh, Mac file paths are written. But the changes that you're going to have to do once you paste in the file path will be the same whether you're dealing with a PC or Mac. Um, so here's how we do for a uh, uh, PC. All right, so we start with our set working directory, open our parentheses, and put in our quotes. Then we, what we need is to get our file path. Uh, and this is where um, some people were confused. So let's, I'm just going to switch over to a, a different, okay, so, okay, so I want to show quickly, um, this is the file path, or this is the folder I have for Lab 2 Home. And one way that you can go about getting uh, the information that you need is um, for the file path, is if you right click in kind of the address bar here and copy address as text. Okay, and then let's go back to our, our studio. If we then paste it in between the quotes, Right, so this looks really similar to what I have up here. The only difference is this is where I've talked about the backslashes versus forward slashes. So uh, generally computers, when they're talking about file folders, will have backslashes like this in. And in R, we need kind of forward ones like that. So the only thing you would have to do is just, once you've copied in your uh, folder, is go through all of them. Make sure not to miss one. You'll get an error if you do, but that's okay. Getting errors in R is not that uncommon. Uh, I get them all the time. It just means if you get it, go back and check what you might have done wrong. So now these are equivalent, and you could run it and load the working directory. So I don't need to run it twice. So I'm going to get rid of this, and I'm going to start by hitting run here. Okay, so now we've told it, told R where to go look at. The second thing I want to do is import the data. We're only going to use this in the exercises later. We might as well do it now. Um, so, and this also had um, some problems. Uh, these were unanticipated problems. Um, so when I created the file for um, the statistics, I created the file with this name here, well, this name and dots. CSV. Unfortunately, when it got uploaded to Leia, Leia added in underscores. So it's always important when you're dealing with importing files, check how the file is saved on your computer. So for me, I would run this. 
but you would might have to write some run something more like So you might have to run something more like that um, because all the spaces got replaced by underscores. So this should help for you. Um, and you don't have to put a file path before because we've already loaded our working directory. So make sure to save the file there. Um, and I've now saved it. So let's see if this actually works. I've now saved it using, okay. And now we got population Canada in there. 13 observations of six variables. Okay. Um, we could have also run, this one is, because I have both saved. Um, so either of these would work depending on it. You can change your name back to how I had it. So you could go into your folder and change it over back to how I had it and you don't have to update the code. Or if you just downloaded it and it came in with the underscores, you could just run this instead. And that's no big problem. Just always make sure when you're uh, when you're setting a working directory, set it to a you know a folder that's actually on your computer, not one that's on mine. That, um, that could definitely cause you a problem. And when you're reading for a file, um, make sure to actually have the file name right. Now, there's actually some a third way that you can do it. Um, that I don't personally like because it doesn't show up as well in your code. But you actually, many of you may actually quite like it. And it's the file.choose command. Um, and essentially file.choose tells R to open up a dialog box um, where that will allow you to search a file like you would normally search a file if you say like file save as, if you go into Word and say file save as, or go into Word and say file open. Um, the same type of box where you could then click through your folders on your computer manually, choose the file that you want. Um, and so then you could go into whatever you've called your lab two folder and then choose this one. Um, I'm not going to do it because I'm not even actually sure that uh, the video capture software will capture the um, folder opening up. Um, but file.choose open and close parentheses. So just make sure to get this right. If you're having trouble just writing this out, uh, you'd still also, sorry, want that include, you'd still want your headers equal to true statement or option. Um, I believe it defaults to header true, so, so that's not, or uh, headers equal true, so that's not too, too important, but it's good to get the habit of putting it. So any of these are options, um, depending on if this was my original data, this is how you probably download it from Leia. And if you just don't like writing in names, you can use file.choose. Unfortunately, you can't use it in set working directory because it's a file choice, so not a folder choice, um, unfortunately. Um, all right, so now we're gonna get, uh, now that um, we've kind of got the setup taken care of, we're gonna work with correlations. Now, um, I wanted to demonstrate different size and, uh, uh, size and direction correlations. So I kind of created a few manually. They're pretty darn artificial, um, but I wanted to be able to control a few things. So they don't have to look like normal data, um, but uh, this was kind of the easiest way so I could show you what different things might look like. So just to start, we just had to create kind of a data set. So we've got a variable that we want to protect. So this would be like, remember in our in, in the lecture, the uh, uh, diamond price um, data set, right? This might be like your diamond price. You could think about it. Uh, and these are the different variables that we have for it. So this could be weight, uh, clarity, uh, color, and something else. Um, so you could think of them. We've got one variable that we want to be predicting and a, so several different possible predictors. Um, and then, so this is what we've seen before, right? We're just creating a different vectors. And in here, in this core data, we're just creating a data set um, of all of these. So we're creating a table, putting the, all of these into a table. 
So I'm just going to run all of these. Okay, and now we've got our core data. I just want to see. So it looks like a table. We've got a variable predict. This is like our price. This could be like our uh, the weight. This could be like the color. This could be the clarity or whatever it is. Uh, and this is something something else. So this is just we've taken all those different variables that we had and we put them together into a data set so that we could say, you know, this is diamond one, this is diamond two, this is diamond three, this is diamond four, so on. Okay. Um, don't forget also to always keep saving as you go along. Uh, now, strictly speaking, to do most of what we're going to do next, um, having a uh, it in the table is not actually necessary. We could have skipped this putting in a table and just kept these variable names. And mo most of the commands we're gonna run later would have worked. Um, I put it into a table because most of the data you're gonna be dealing with in your life will come in the form of uh, a table or, um, in either a CSV file or a text file or something like that. Um, so I want you to get used to working with uh, data frames uh, or tables. Um, rather than just with individual variables because your variables will always be stored when you're dealing in you know future classes will always be stored in some sort of uh, table um, okay so first thing we're going to do uh, is we're going to plot a scatter plot so like in a lecture we're going to start with some some graphics um, so remember the scatter plots one where say for each diamond and we want to be saying price and weight you know diamond one gets a point according to where its price and its weight diamond two gets a point based on its weight and its price diamond three gets you know based on its we go out weight on the x-axis and price on the y-axis so diamond one is over here and then up here and diamond two is over here up here so we put the point um and so uh we use the plot command to do this so it's an easy one to remember just to plot uh, and uh, whenever we're dealing with a correlation or a scatter plot, right, which is kind of used for looking for correlations graphically, remember that when we're dealing with correlations, we're dealing with two variables. We're seeing how, you know, what is the relation, strength of the relationship between two different variables. So in plot, we have to be giving it two different variables. We have to tell it, you know, I want one variable to be on the x-axis and I want another variable to be on the y-axis and so that's what we've done here we write plot x variable y variable right so if you've got one variable it's not going to work um, so you need and the entire variable not just individual points but you want the entire variable because remember we're done with the diamonds we want all say in the diamonds I think there are 23 I think we want all 23 diamond on here. I think here there's 10 points in our core data, uh, which just for sure for correlation data. Um, I think there's 10 data points. We want 10 different points. So in this one, we're saying like, again, think of this as being kind of the, the uh, weight and this is the diamond price. Uh, and so we've got the X axis variable and the Y axis variable. And so again, when we're uh, dealing with data frames, we have to tell our both the data frame name and the variable name, um, because you could have a, a variable just you know this that's different. So you've got a in a different table that you've loaded. You could have, for example, you could have had something called a var or var pause perfect could have been in population Canada for all you know too, right? It's, it could have been. Sometimes you're going to get variables. Um, say, for example, say you're dealing with multiple surveys. In almost every data set, you're going to have a variable called gender or age, uh, some, maybe something on ideology. So, right, so say you had two different surveys. This was a survey and this were a survey. Um, if you just wrote gender, R doesn't know, do I look in correlation data for, or do I look in population Canada for gender? So you've got to tell it what data frame are we looking at, what table, what data set are we looking at, and then what variable are we looking at. So our data set is called core data. We do the dollar sign and our variable, variable one and variable two. Then the next, so if we just ran this, uh, I can show you an example. 
without anything extra. Without anything extra. Okay. We just ran this without those other lines that I've included. We would get this graph here. Um, but if you look at this and this, it just means a data set and a variable. So, you know, for a lab, that's not the worst thing in the world. If you're putting this into a paper, that's pretty ugly. Uh, it doesn't necessarily tell the reader much about what it is, and it, you know, we we'd like proper words. So there's all kinds of in R commands that you can use to kind of uh, set options for your graphs, and, and we're not going to learn almost any of them. These are probably the last ones we're going to learn um, in this class. But I just wanted to show you that it's possible and just make it slightly cleaner graphs. So we use. Um, an option called X label and Y label, X lab and Y lab. And then we write, what do we want uh, the variables to be called? Or what do we want the labels to be called? What do we want the X label and the Y label to be called? And we put them in quotes because whenever we're dealing with character variables, whenever we're dealing with string, we've got to put it in quotes. Um, otherwise, R is not really going to know what to do with it. Um, and so we say, OK, I want the X label to be called perfect positive, And I want the Y label to be called predicted. Now to do this, we separate. So we write in our first our, our X variable, our Y variable, then a comma, then X label, comma, Y label, close our parentheses. Now technically, we could have done it on one line. So let's say that. we could have done. And at first, this, what I'm about to do may make more sense to you guys. Right, so we've got our first variable, our second variable, option one, option two. And option one is our X label, option two is our Y label. And it's fine, right? Um, it's understandable, this would work just fine. You know, if I run this, we'll get, see, now nicer labels on our axes, which is great. Um, but uh, it can be harder to read. Imagine also when you're dealing with longer commands, you know, there's sometimes commands that go on you know, you might be listing if you're doing a multiple regression. So we've only done kind of two variable regressions. Uh, we did in the last lecture. Um, but you might be dealing with multiple variables. Say you want to predict the price of a diamond and you're dealing at the same time with its, you know, its uh, cut, its clarity, uh, its color, its, its uh, size, um, all at the same time. And you've got multiple options. It could get to be a really long command and you don't want to be scrolling through to see a command. You don't want to be having to do kind of like what this does. You, you don't want uh, yeah, to have to scroll. It makes it hard to read. It also, just in terms of you know, seeing the different parts of a command, um, having it on one line can be clunky for people to see what's going on. So what I like to do, and it's kind of conventional a lot, is to sometimes separate, particularly when you start getting into options, um, separating your code into uh, multiple lines, getting into options, or if just any part of your code is getting too long, separate it into multiple lines. Um, so there's a couple of restrictions for when you can separate into lines. Um, you have to, a parenthesis has to be open, uh, and it has to be done after a comma. So we could do this, right? And you'll see the indenting. And if you see the indenting, um, it means that it's within, say, this parenthesis. And that's great. If you skip lines and you don't get an indenting, um, it's probably that something went wrong. So this is the exact code that we had before, right, on one line. But now we separate it across three. So it's a little bit more legible as to what's happening. We're plotting these two things. 
and we're assigning it these two options. So this is now, to the eye, is a lot easier to read. Okay, so let's get rid of this because we don't want to have two of them. So this is the graph that we just ran. Now across multiple lines. And we can do it for the other correlations too. So see, actually, I'm just going to run all four and then we can go backwards. Okay. So see here, and this is why I kind of gave them names, kind of hinting at what they're meant to be. This is a perfect positive correlation, or at least it sure looks like it. We'll test it when we run find the regression coefficient later. Uh, but they increase together as this variable increases, so does this one. And it seems to, you know, there seems to be no variation, right? If you know the value of x, you can perfectly seemingly predict the value of y. There's a very, very clear pattern here. Uh, the next one, right, it's descending, right? As the value of x goes up, the value of y goes down. Um, and there's more variation, right? If I know the value of x, I don't necessarily know the value of y, right? Like, so this one, you know, it goes down, then up, then down, then up, then down, then up, then down, then up. So if you know that there's an increase in x, you know that in general it's going to be moving down, but you can't say any individual point with certainty is going to be down. Um, you, you know, there's going to be a scattering. You could have two points, you know, with 20, and one might be here, one might be here, one might be here, like at different heights. Uh, third, so again, we, we could kind of see that there's a trend of increasing here, but it's much less predictable. It's a much weaker correlation. Generally, we see that it's increasing. As x goes up, y kind of goes up, um, or in general, over time goes up. But there's a lot of variation. Sometimes, you know, a point's going to go down. Sometimes it's going to uh, go up. Uh, so again, if you knew that, say, the uh, value of x was 50, there may be some values of y that are quite low. Some might be quite high. Uh, so you couldn't perfectly predict. And then finally, um, this is a weak, much weaker correlation. You could generally say that it seems to be going down, but it's much more looks almost more like a cloud than anything. Uh, there's a lot of variation. I mean, if you look right around uh, what would be, I guess, uh, around 25, 2025, you've got a point that's really, really low, and you've got a point that's really, really high. Uh, and then again, similar around to where you think of 30 on the x-axis, you've got a point that's really, really high and a point that's really, really low. Uh, so, so we could generally say it's going down, but knowing x isn't going to help us too, too much in predicting y. So these are scatter plots, so we can see kind of just visually, is there a relationship? Um, and so at its most basic, all you need is the plot variable 1, variable 2. And because our, date, our variables are are part of a data frame, we also have to set or specify the data frame or our table. If you're not a big fan of data frame idea, um, our table. So in both of those, we set in all of these, it starts with core data dollar sign. Okay, so now we've kind of visually inspected our, uh, our data. Um, and we could kind of see whether there's positive or negative correlations. Um, but we'd like to know a little bit more about the strength of the correlations. How strong are they? Um, and so we can use the uh, correlation coefficient, which we saw R um, in class, and see how strongly these, uh, the direction and the strength of the correlations. And to, uh, find the correlation coefficient, we use the command called core or COR. Um, and similar to plot, remember plotting, we're plotting two different variables together. Same thing with correlation, we're just seeing the strength of the relationship. So you need to specify what is variable one, again, pointing to the, uh, the table, and what is variable two. 
right? What is our x-axis variable? What is our y-axis variable? What, which two are we looking at together to see the relationship? Um, if you're only specifying one, you're just testing how what's correlated with itself, and that's not useful for what uh, we're talking about. Um, so you've just got to specify variable one and variable two. Um, and so here I've done the four different ones, right? So we've got, again, each time think of like uh, var predict as our price, our diamond price. And here are the four different kind of predictor things. So we're always we're kind of running the correlation for how well do they predict our diamond price. And so if we run all four of these, we get the correlation coefficients. And so uh, the positive perfect one, in, in fact, was positive, uh, was a perfect positive one because we see um, plus one, or we see it's not plus written, but um, if there's no plus, it, it means positive. Uh, then for this one, we see negative. And if you remember the graph, it was a de descending one, so that negative. Um, and it looked quite tight together. And that would be this one, right? This, the graph over here. Uh, and we see, yeah, in fact, it is really strong. Uh, negative uh, 0.95, which is a really, really strong correlation. The third graph uh, was, again, positive. Um, but it was starting to get uh, a little bit you know, more spread out. Uh, we, it didn't look like there was kind of as strong of a pattern. You couldn't predict y nearly as well if you knew x. And we see, yeah, there's kind of a, a medium to almost strong, but a medium size positive correlation of 0.67. And then finally, in the last one, the one that kind of had a general seeming to go down, but not terribly strong, we've got a, a negative 0 0.37. And when you're dealing with data sets, you're sometimes going to find, like, this may look very weak, but you're actually going to find some correlations that are even weaker than that. Uh, negative 0 0.37 is almost a medium-sized correlation. And, I mean, while there is kind of a going down, just looks really, really spread out. Um, it's almost hard to see a pattern. Um, and it still got to 0 0.37. So you can imagine what ones that get to 0 point, you know, 10, a correlation of 0 point 10, um, how spread out or cloud-like those will be. So that's just, I mean, for correlation, find the correlation coefficient is actually quite simple, right? You just use core and then you use variable one, variable two, always again, pointing to the data frame or the table. So we're, we're dealing with the table correlation data. VAR predict is in the table correlation data. Uh, we're looking at VAR pause perfect. VAR pause perfect is found in the table core data. And so telling R look there. And so that's correlation coefficients are quite simple. So now we're going to deal, this is going to be a little bit more complicated, this part. Um, so we're going to be dealing with finding the best fit lines. And if you remember when we were talking about best fit lines, we were using the least squares method, right? Which finds the, um, the line that has the smallest sum of the squared residuals. So the residual was the difference between, you know, what we predict and reality. Um, and that's a residual. If, and so the sum of the square residuals, you take the residual for each point, you square the residual for each point and you sum them and then you take the line that produces the smallest one. Not ever something you're gonna to have to calculate. Um, luckily, statistical softwares will do it for you. Um, so since we're using a linear relationship, we can use ordinarily squares regression. So the least squares regression um, is typically referred to as ordinary least squares, but you could just think of it as you know, the least squares that we're using. It's the only regression we're gonna see in this class. Um, to use, uh, to conduct an ordinary least square regression, we use the LM for a linear model command because uh, we're doing, we're looking for linear. We're not learning in this class. We talked about in the lecture how you could have nonlinear relationships. We're not looking at any methods for finding those because they're a lot more complicated. Uh, the format is LM, so predicted variable, so your Y variable. So uh, the one thing to be careful here is kind of the order changes from your plot. Your y-axis variable now comes first. Uh, then uh, this symbol here, your predictor 
variable. Actually, just for consistency, let's put a underscore here. Not that it matters, the comment. And then your data set. So there's a couple of differences um, in your LM command. Um, your uh, predictive variable, uh, your predictive variable, so the price or your y-axis variable comes first. You don't separate it by comma, you separate it by um, this symbol here, and your x-axis variable comes second. And the second difference is we point to the data, or we can point to the data uh, like this, uh, with data equals data set. So here we wrote core data and uh, dollar sign variable. In this case, we would look at, we wouldn't write core data dollar sign variable, we'd just write variable name and variable name. So we'd write this variable name first, this symbol, this variable name second, without any of this core data stuff. And then we'd write comma data is equal to core data. Uh, and that's the most you know, common way of uh, doing it. Now, strictly speaking, um, you don't actually have to make this difference. Data is equal to core data. It's the way I usually do it, so that's kind of the way I wrote it for you guys. Um, if you did kind of like how we had done before, you still could run We could still put the data frame like we had before. Uh, so this would work cut similar to the format we had before. Again, we still have to switch the order, still have to put the y-axis and then the x-axis. We're kind of setting up an equation here. So if you had multiple variables, you'd put a plus plus for other ones. So you're setting kind of like y is equal to x. That's why the order is reversed. So you could, but so the y still always has to stay before the x, but you could, like we've done before in most of our other ones, use core data dollar sign and ignore this data is equal to. Um, that would be fine too. So if you're just more comfortable with using data frame or table dollar sign variable, a table dollar sign variable, that's fine. Um, just myself, when I use uh, LM, I usually use data is equal to uh, data frame or table. Um, so that's the way I taught it, taught you. Um, but if you'd like to, if you'd prefer to use this format, um, that's absolutely fine. Um, so what this does, um, all of this, so kind of runs the, conducts a regression and finds what the, uh, the, uh, regression line is or the best fit line is. Um, we name this as an object or a variable, right? Because it's actually going to produce a lot of information. Um, and so if we run this, see, so, and then I'll just show you what comes out first. Um, it's not something that I typically look at when I run a regression, but It's showing us, okay, so it's done this formula and it's got two coefficients. Um, and so remember when we're, what we're doing when we're finding, when we're running the regression is we're looking for what is the best fit line. And if you remember, we had um, the equation with line is always equal to y is equal to mx plus b. And we've got our, um, uh, we've got our y-intercept and we've got, the uh, coefficient for the variable. So we've got, we need to find B or, uh, for, as our y-intercept, and we need to find M in the kind of y is equal to mx plus B, or in regression terms, we usually read as B is equal to uh, or B0 uh, plus B1x. 
we need to, so B0 or beta, uh, beta naught is your Y intercept and beta one is your slope in, in this case. Um, so what we need to do when, if we're finding a line, we need those two va values. And these are what these two coefficients are giving. Intercept is giving, this is the value for the Y intercept. And this is the value for the slope of our line. And so all different regressions will give that. Um, this isn't all the information we'd usually want though. Um, it's certainly important information, but it's not all the information we want. So usually what we would do kind of the next step after running it, that's why we rarely would just even look at that. We'd look at the summary statistics or the summary of the regression object. So it kind of summarizes everything we got out of testing for the best fit line. Now, a lot of this doesn't gonna make sense, um, but actually I'm gonna show it with a different correlation because um, this one's too clean. So let's just quickly run with this one, All right? So we ran our equation and now we want the summary. We, we're finding the best fit line. So this is the information about the best fit line, right? We found our best fit line and you can get the coefficient here, but we might want more information. So this gives kind of the summary of the best fit line or kind of the search for the best fit line. Um, and we can ignore most of it for right now. Um, there's a couple things to look at. First are your estimates, right? So we'll go into the coefficients part and look at the estimates, right? So your y-intercept is right here. Your uh, slope is right here. And that makes sense, right? Our slope is negative and we are running uh, the one for the strong negative correlation. We are running the regression. We already knew that there was a ne negative slope here um, because, or we could have guessed there was a negative slope because it was a negative correlation. And so that makes sense. It's going down. So you can ignore all this stuff for now. Um, later in the course, some of the stuff will make sense. Uh, but for now, you can ignore them. Um, and the other thing that you'll want to care about is the R squared. Um, and we had talked about the R squared is the squared of the um, correlation coefficient. And it explains the proportion of explained variance. So how much of the variance in Y um, is explained by uh, our best fit line. Uh, and any variance that's unexplained, right? So if R squared is less than one, means that our predictor variable, so the X axis one, isn't explaining perfectly. So if we look at, say, this graph, right? So we, we could fit a line kind of along like that, but for each point, there'd be some difference. So our line can explain some of the variation, but there's also that residual that our line doesn't explain. Um, and so R squares talking about how much of the proportion um, is explained. So we can run the other two. And so again, we're always just only looking for now at the coefficients. What's your y-intercept? What's your slope? And what's the r-squared? And the r-squared should always be the square of uh, the, uh, uh, the square of the correlation coefficient. So the, the square of r. Then the last thing we want to do, so now that we've got kind of our best fit lines, it'd be nice to actually see them. So yes, it's not lovely to know this is the y-intercept and this is the slope, but it'd be nice to see it. So we can take our plots that we have, or we can remake the plots essentially, but we add um, the AB line command. And that uh, AB line can actually fit a lot of different things, but in this uh, per uh, particular case, we're gonna be telling it to fit the line for um, the regression line. Um, and so we start with, in this case, the same as plot command that we used before, right? So this is exactly what we'd used earlier, plot variable one, variable two, so x-axis variable, y-axis variable. We still want our labels. And then in command right below, we use AB line 
and the name of whatever you saved your regression object as, right? So if you notice up here, I saved the regression object, kind of the, the results of this equation of the LM command, I saved it as something pause perfect LM. And I use that in the summary. I also use it in AB line. And so this is essentially telling it, take this plot, you know, the scatter plot we had and fit this line on it. There's a lot of different ways you can do it, but the code for this was simpler, so I gave you this one. You can see, so we've got the same plot that we had before, but now we've got our best fit line, that regression line that we found with here, um, with the y-intercept and the uh, uh, slope. It's, it's the same. We can do it for the other ones too. So here we go. We've got now a regression line that's going the best fit line for these points, the best fit line for these points, and the best fit line for these points. So now we've got kind of the line that fits the, this is the ideal line, at least from the perspective of the least squares, uh, so minimizing the sum of the residuals. Um, so of all the possible lines, if you take the square, so you take the uh, square of this residual, square of this residual, doesn't look like there's much of one, square of this residual, square of this residual, square of this residual, square of this residual, all of these, this is the line that has the smallest squaring of, or smallest sum of the square of all of those different residuals. And we practiced calculating um, sum of square for you know some sample data, but you obviously couldn't run it for all possible data. But this is given the line that um, is ideal from that perspective, and that's really useful, right? Because now we've still got our points, and we've got the line that's kind of identifying. Is our, this is our these are our predictions based on x. This is what we predict y would be based on, you know, x. This, if we have an x of equal to 50, so say uh, a price of 50,000, say this were in thousands, uh, or sorry, a weight of uh, um, 50 something in uh, for diamond, right? We would expect it to have this price. And if we have a uh, weight of this, whatever unit in for diamonds, this is the price that we would expect it to have. All right, now let's just go through the setup for the exercises. So again, set working directory, we've already done it. We've already imported our, uh, our data, um, but in case you haven't, you can do it. Remember, you can use for importing the data. So remember, you always have to give it a data set name. That's really important. Uh, I've seen definitely people forget to do it, and then you're not going to know how to tell R to look in it. Um, so remember, for most of you, you're going to have to Unless you rename the, the file that you uh, saved, you're going to have to use the underscore here. And, or you can use the file.choose open parentheses and close parentheses, right? The file.choose that within it. And you can go back in the video uh, for scene where I talk more about that. So let's just take a quick look at our data. So head, um, and so you can see that some of these data points are really, really, really big, right? Because population in, you know, a 2016 uh, Ontario would be 13 million something. So this is a clunky kind of number to look at. So then we're going to come back to that in a second. And string, we just get a little, oops. Oops, sorry, I still haven't imported the data. And I had a spelling mistake. Um, those uh, always you'll get an error if your spelling uh, is off. So there we go. 
now we can see a problem is a factor variable, so it's category. We, we know this one gets a list of province names. And then we've got some integer and some numeric ones. Um, now, again, I don't particularly like dealing with, you know, variable, like it's hard to read, especially because there's no commas. You know, is this 13 million? Just looking at it, is it, uh, you know, 1.3 million? Is it 130 million? Just looking at it off the top, people don't really want to count. Um, so I want to transform it and change. This is population, so total people. I'd like to try to change these different population ones to be maybe thousands of people. Uh, it'll just make the numbers a little bit more manageable. So how can we do that? Well, we can create a new variable in this data frame um, that takes thousands of people. So what we want to do is first we want to say, okay, we're still dealing in population Canada, but we're creating this new variable, right? Because it's not currently a valuable name this. And we're giving it the value of our current population 2016. Uh, and uh, data dividing it by a thousand. And so that'll give it in terms of total people, it'll give it in terms of thousands of people. So if we run that, and I want to do it again for 2011. So we divide by, so we've again, now we've told it to create a, in our data frame called population Canada. So in our table called population Canada, we want a new variable called population 2011 thousands. And that value, that variable will take on the value of population 2011 from population Canada divided by a thousand. So whatever, say the population were 13 million for Ontario, we would take 13 million divided by a thousand. And that's what the Ontario would be uh, for, this uh, for this variable. And it affects uh, 8 million, we would, for population 2011,000, it'd be uh, 8 million divided by 1,000. So we can do both of those. Land area is also really big. So I'd like to divide that into thousands of kilometers rather than just being square kilometers. I'd like to make it into thousands of square kilometers. So we do this and then we divide, divide by 1,000. Make sure that uh, you got your capitalization, your capitalization right. So um, I made a fairly unfortunate choice, um, just on consistency, that population, population, the existing variables all had capitals for the first word, and I put them in the lowercase, which wasn't an ideal decision, because then you're going to have to always be remembering. Um, so it would have been better if I had used a capital P, capital P, and capital L here. Um, but at the end of the day, as long as you're just, you're just careful, not to make it the end of the world. So here we've created in population Canada again. So in that table, we've created a new variable. So a new column called land area thousands. And the data that makes up that variable or in population Canada, that new one is called, is called, uh, is the value of land area divided by a thousand. So let's take a look at it. So let's look at Head before, actually, what I would like to do maybe is, uh, or no, it's too late. So, here before we had province, population 2016, population 2011, uh, population percent change, land area, and population density. Right now, we've got all those same variables, population density, right? So, all of this is the same. So we've now got a population 2016,000 variable, we've got a population 2011,000, uh, and we've got a land area 1,000 variable. So these are the three we created. And if you take a look at them, population 2016, look at the first entry, was 519,716. The first entry for population 2016,000 was 519.716, uh, right? And so there's 519,000 people um, if we go in thousands of people, that means there's 519 thousands of people. If there's 13 million, that means there's 13,448 thousands of people. Um, so it just we're dealing with more read legible numbers. Same thing here, 514,536 for the first one. So the number here is just this one divided by a thousand. 
the number for uh, Prince Edward Island is just the value of Prince Edward Island divided by a thousand. The number for Nova Scotia is just Nova Scotia population divided by a thousand. And same thing for land area, right? Land area is just 370,514 uh, square kilometers. Now it's 500, uh, or sorry, uh, 370 um, thousands of square kilometers. So we just kind of transformed the data. And it's just that it makes, if you're labeling in a plot, if you're labeling axes, you want, you know, you don't want to be dealing with millions often. Um, and if you're just kind of reading the data, it's easier to read 370 point something than it is to read 370,514, particularly when you start getting up into the millions. Uh, it's easier to read 1,356 than it is to read uh, 1,356,625. So just in terms of kind of looking at the data, um, it's easier to get an idea um, if you transform it into, now you've got to be careful with your units, right? So these are thousands of square kilometers, these are thousands of square kilometers, uh, or sorry, this is thousands of square kilometers, this is thousands of people, this is thousands of people. So you've got to be careful in identifying that what you've done. So in your axis on a graph, you'd want to say thousands of square kilometers, thousands of people. Um, stuff like that. And so now you've got, so now that you've created these new variables, and they're sort of transforming the old ones. So you're taking the value of each one of them and dividing it by a thousand. So each entry, so this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, each one of them got divided by a thousand. And so now that you've got this, you're ready to answer the exercises. And the exercises are just using, you know, the functions that we used here. So you might need to do a plot, you might use, need to do an AB line. You might need to do a LM, uh, and you might need to do a core and a plot, right? Like, so it's just these things. So remember, plot is x-axis variable, y-axis variable. Uh, core is x-axis variable, or variable one, variable two. Again, always look point into the table. LM is variable or y-axis variable, x-axis variable. And then uh, plot. Again, is so x-axis variable, y-axis variable, and then a, b line, we're using whatever we named our regression output. So whatever we named the output from LM, we put that in a, b line, and that's telling it to fit a line that's the best fit line, plain to put on. So those are the only things that you're gonna need to do in the, uh, in the lab, or in the exercises for the lab. So if you have any more questions, feel free to let me know, but hopefully this clears up a lot of the different things.